presentation is on uh, wind instruments and specifically how to deal with the difficult problem of a rotating mass and true wind. Am I right? More or less, yeah. Uh, I mean, more or less. Well, I tried to make it a little bit broader so it wouldn't be super boring for anybody. It's going to be boring no matter what. So, yeah. oh, man. Oh, man. Look, we have show and tell here. That's great. Awesome. Okay. Um, and with yeah. that, let's get we have Bill Quigley and Fred Pergola. Pergola. And, Sorry. and we also and have Arthur. I'm sorry, Gilan, that you're not on the slide, but uh, lastly, mean, real quickly, there is VHF tape for those that really need it in the back of the room. The, there's VHF one. tape. Oh, oh, can they do your side space? <laughs> <laughs> right? right. That was a joke. I, I use cassettes, okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah VHF yeah. That yeah. doesn't work well. Sure. Sorry, I'm sorry, I just had it so that yeah. because yeah. people on Zoom can see um, that speaking. Yeah, I Okay, can the people online see the... Oh, you're sharing the wrong desktop. <laughs> I got you. I'm keeping an eye on yeah. it. We were saying the presenter view. That's really mad. Yeah, we're working on that. Too. Whose voice is that? It's so mad. Thank you. Yeah. Somebody on Zoom? Okay, so... To try to make this a little more interesting, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of a little bit of history in terms of like marine electronics, because there's been this sort of revolution in marine electronics, like in the past, I don't know, five or 10 years. We've all had NMEA 0183 instruments on our boat, right? Like it's basic stuff where all of a sudden one instrument could talk to another instrument, except it was more or less point to point. And around in the 80s, um, it was fairly useful for getting data like GPS data into a, into a chart potter or something like that. Um, and then, uh, so what happened to Marine Instruments was that sometime in the 80s, this company Bosch uh, developed um, a protocol for cars, for gadgets or devices in cars to talk to each other. Uh, it's called a CAN bus. And the idea was prior to this, um, in a car, you had like several, I've heard several, you could have several thousand meters of wire, right? Because if anything in a car needed to kind of communicate with anything else, you just put a wire between the two. It's kind of like our boats on a larger scale. And so they developed this CAN bus so that everything could just kind of talk on a, on a network in your car. It's very basic, very robust. Um, and that allowed them to do things like, uh, does anybody have a car here that, um, that has automatic windshield wipers, right? The rain sensing, right? So that's really cool. My current car doesn't, my old car did. Um, there's what the, what you can do now, and since you can do this since the 90s, is that uh, there's a rain sensor, right? And the rain sensor, it's not just controlling the windshield wipers, it's actually putting data on this CAN bus. The windshield's wet, the windshield's wet, the windshield's wet, right? So in some cars, the automatic, uh, the anti-lock braking system will, uh -huh listen for that information. And when it hears that the windshield's wet, it'll go like, boop. it'll just touch the brake disc with the, with the pads. And that has the effect of drying out the brake discs. So when it's raining and your windshield wipers are going by themselves, your stopping distance is reduced. And that's all because they made this one device that just says, hey, the windshield's wet. And then they made this other device that says, oh, if the windshield's wet, then I need to, then the, the brake discs are probably wet and I'm going to dry them out. So that, you know, when you put your phone down because you stopped texting in the car and <laughs> it was doing 75 stop, <laughs> you know, maybe you want it. Okay. So then the National Marine Electronics Association took that kind of bus architecture and said, hey, we're going to use that in boats. And that's how we got to uh, NMEA 2000, which is kind of what we're going to talk about tonight. This, I brought a lot of show and tell stuff. This is uh, an NMEA 2000, um, kind of like a, a connector, a bus connector, right? Uh, it has um, the electronic equivalent of a manifold. Yeah, kind of. We're really, I don't know if anybody remembers like uh, Ethernet over coax from the 80s. Um, so this is kind of like this, this um, backbone. Backbone. Thank you. Uh, it's got termination resistors at the end, and then you just plug stuff into it, and everything 
talks to each other and everything's happy and it has a much, much higher data rate. The original NMEA 0183 was 4,800 bits per second. Um, AAS devices can go up to like 38,000, but this is 250,000. So a lot faster, you can handle a lot more data. On our boats, we don't tend to have all this sort of junk hooked up, but um, it's still very kind of powerful and robust. Um, so then this other kind of revolution happened about, I don't know. So this is a proprietary protocol, right? You, you have to basically either be a part of NMEA, like Garmin, or you have to pay a lot of money to get access to this protocol. So about like 10 or 15 years ago, people started sort of tinkering with it and they sort of um, figured out how this protocol works. And one guy in particular, this guy named Timo Lapalanianian, he's a, a Finn, um, wrote a bunch of software that interprets the NMEA 2000 data and lets you do things with it. And uh, he sort of published this as open source, which means that anybody who wants to can take all the software and do whatever they want with it. The only restriction is that you can't take it and then sort of modify it and resell it. If you modify it, you have to kind of put those changes back out into what's essentially the public domain. Um, and you know, I could go on for hours about open source software, uh, but that might take us down into the, into the, <laughs> to the like, border. Oh, please but, do. <laughs> but the bottom line is that there's all these really cool things you can do now uh, with uh, marine instruments uh, that you couldn't do before because there are thousands of people out there sort of tinkering with this stuff. So here's a couple of examples. Um, this is all about power. And this is really, so for, for power boaters and for people who have a lot of solar and are, you know, uh, doing everything on solar in the boat, they don't plug in. Um, there's a lot of really interesting things you can do because you can now monitor your batteries, your solar panels. Um, all that stuff is done, typically, you have to do it on a computer. So this is a little computer, it's called a Raspberry Pi. And it was invented in the UK to teach uh, students uh, stuff about computers. It's very simple. Um, it's, uh, this one costs about $50 and it's so powerful that all of this stuff that you can, that you want to do like chart plotting, uh, monitoring your engine, your controls, monitoring your instruments, all that stuff can be done on this tiny little computer here. This one also actually, I was going to plug it in, uh, has a little, this is a GPS, right? So you can also tell where you are. Um, so this is uh, sort of a set of software called Signal K. And again, it's open source, it's free, and people are constantly developing things to, to work with Signal K. Signal K is basically uh, an open source or a free mechanism for using NMEA 2000 data. So you can have all these proprietary instruments and you can now look at all the things that they're saying to each other and you can do whatever you want with that data. Um, so here's an example. This is actually a video of, of one of my cell phones. Uh, and this is uh, just an app for Signal K. Again, it's free. It's called KIP. It'll let you set up these um, sort of instrument panels, instrument clusters. So what you're looking at is uh, a wind gauge, obviously true and apparent wind, um, speed over ground and speed through water. So if you're racing, that would be kind of useful, even if you're not racing, for determining uh, if you're getting set by a current, right? And then also wind, in wind information is really useful too. So this is a free app running on an old phone that's now probably worth $50. And that's doing everything that a $500 Garmin, you know, GNX20 display can do, except it took me about five minutes to set this up the way I wanted. And, if, and you can see these arrows, you have pages, right? So you can set up another page that shows you something else. And so, you know, instead of buying more displays for your boat, you can now just do this on your phone. And this is getting information from uh, software that's running on a, a device like this. Bill, yeah, what what's the the progression from the 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 can bus with its backbone, yeah, to this? I mean, does this uh, have yeah. a good question, Vince? So um, Vince's question, if anybody couldn't hear, because he can kind of mumble sometimes, <laughs> is uh, how does that get? How does this stuff on the can bus get into um, get into get into this? Right. So um, this little gadget is called a hat. Uh, it's a it's an RS45 can hat. So these terminals here will connect. Actually, you can see another example here. Um, these are these are NMEA 2000 or CAN bus connectors, 
right? So this uh, little Raspberry Pi computer, when I, I can plug this in, I can plug this into my boat's network through one of these ports, um, and it will start listening because I have the Signal K software running on this Raspberry Pi, it starts just sucking in all this data. And then what you do with it is kind of like, kind of up to you after that. If, if you just put it into Signal K, then you get all these cool apps that show you, you know, there's chart plotters, there's uh, instrument panels and so forth. Um, so does that, does that answer that question? Sort of, you plug yeah. it in. You plug it in. You plug it into your boat's network. <laughs> yeah, but when you say your boat's network, what physically are we talking about? Here? Uh, this. One of the, that. So I have a couple of these on my boat, and they're connected to all the Garmin instruments and all the transducers. I actually have some diagrams of what's going on on my boat. Yeah. And we have some some Mojo diagrams, too, uh, that will maybe will make that more okay. clear. Your old phone is plugged into the back phone with an adapter? Oh, no. Uh, good Good question. This is... Uh, that's getting out of our Wi-Fi. So, so this thing is on a either it creates its own Wi-Fi network, uh -huh. uh, or if you typically what I do is I just create a Wi-Fi network using my phone, like a, a, a tether in tethering, you know, hotspot hot mode. Right. And so everything on the boat automatically sort of tethers. jumps into that network, and then they can all just talk to each other. <laughs> um, and that's interesting because uh, I think you broke this. <laughs> you broke me. <laughs> no, I'm gonna go get my paper. So charts. here's the thing. I mean, one of my the points I'm trying to make is if I can do if you can fix your boat, you can do any of this stuff. There are these like blog posts online that just walk you through like this is how to get this stuff set up, and it's really it's become really easy and apparent. And also because there's so many people interested in like making this stuff work. But you can ask a really stupid question, and there are people who are going to be out there who are going to say, like, oh, here's how you fix that. And they're also going to be thinking, like, oh, we need to change the way that documentation, we need to make it more simple, right, easier. So if you say something stupid, you get more feedback than if you say something smart. So it's better to say something wrong to have a lot of reaction, a lot of feedback. People love to correct. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, so. Um, they're going to love me. <laughs> what we have, or what we have, this is actually an uh, image from the race to Alaska. If you can, if you look at closely enough, you can see we're getting close to Bella Bella at the blazing speed of 1.9 knots. Um, yes. This also, we, this is we were 56.9 miles from Bella Bella. So, so that is standard Navionics, which of course, like everything else, is now owned by Garmin, right? And I still really like that that application for just navigation on your boat. Um, that is a waterproof tablet that you know cost me like 150 bucks and it's I still put it we had a little plastic screen because it rains so much in the middle of Alaska <laughs> you guys are gonna be really? wet yeah. um this is an app uh called sale timer which isn't free but it's close to free it's like 30 bucks a year for a subscription also has really interesting information like on this one you can see your you can set up these custom charts this one shows the variation in your heading over time uh you can show like sort of variations in in fact here you can see in the back this line is uh is your variation in your speed, right? And, and it does show your BMG. We'll get more into that later. And this is this is called Kit. Again, this is totally free. This is the app that I showed you running on my phone. Um, and then I'll just go through these really quickly. So this is this is another cell timer. Uh, you can you can run it on a on an e-ink display like a like a Kindle. And then I have a picture here. This is something that Joel and Patty just posted because all of their instruments on their boat. This is in the Panama Canal. All their instruments are, they don't have any custom instruments, right? So this is just a regular tablet. I think it's an iPad that they're using Navionics on. And then they have this thing called a Books. It's, it was intended to be a, an e an ebook reader, right? It's about 200 bucks and it shows all of their, uh, all of their data, right? So this is, these two are replacing like several thousand dollars of proprietary uh, gear. And this is, you know, Joel and Patty, they're in the Atlantic now. They just went through the Panama Canal. They've been on their boat for, for what, a year or two? Uh, so it's working for them. Um, okay, so now I just want to shift over to what's going on with our instruments. So, okay, so now we're kind of starting to get into, slowly getting into the part where we talk about, uh, about mass rotation. <laughs> um, there we go. All right. If you're online, can yeah, you share. Sure. 
Make sure okay, you drag Paul, you're with that. I have a oh, right. about the Thank raspberry you. pie. There you go. Yes. <laughs> how how uh, water repellent are the raspberry pie? Oh, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, so inside and up against the ceiling where they stay dry. Yeah, in fact, you'll see a picture of my what's in my boat, and you can get uh, waterproof enclosures for them. Oh, okay. Um, and in fact, on my boat, these so these are actually panel mount. Yeah, you can see. So yes. you can put that through the side of the waterproof enclosure, and so it's it's as waterproof as any other uh, device on your boat. Okay, so for a long time I didn't have any instruments, uh, and I was happy. <laughs> uh, but I did learn, I did a few uh, races that were overnight, particularly like in the race to Alaska, our second night um, on the, I don't know, the southeast side of Vancouver Island, very light and fluky wind. And uh, Mark Dix, who was, geez, just a hardcore guy, he had put um, uh, glow in the dark yarn on a jib. <laughs> and so like every five minutes, he was running up to the jib with this UV flashlight to sort of reactivate the telltales. <laughs> and they would last for about five minutes so we could see, because it was very light and fluky wind, right? <laughs> and that's when I decided I'm not doing another overnight race without a wind instrument. <laughs> so this is, you asked in the email, like, well, why am I doing this? Partly it was, you know, I wanted, I wanted better, just better information. Probably it's because I just want to try and be a better sailor. In fact, Vince and I have had these discussions about, you know, uh, what how do you maximize VMG, right? And on our and on our boats, particularly like on a small trimaran, it's hard. Like his guys, you know, as Dan Hill was saying, his crew. I don't know if anybody, everybody knows this, but like his crew's been sailing with each other for so long, they don't talk, right? Like Johnny, who's one of his crew, he'll go, pros. <laughs> And <laughs> and Froze will kind of look and see what Johnny's looking at, and he'll fix something. He'll trim something, right? They don't talk anymore. I don't have that kind of crew, and I don't have that kind of experience. So for me, I need like external uh, help to sail better, right? And one of those things is going to be trying to figure out, okay, how do I maximize my my VMG, whether it's up or down wind? And for that, I need I need to know where the wind is coming from, because as you know, on our on these small trimarans, maybe not on the bigger catamarans so much, but on the smaller trimarans. You can be you can be pinching and you're still not going to know because you're still going pretty fast and you're pinching long before the telltales really start to luff or you can be stalling right you can be going too low and you're still doing okay and also the confusing thing is like if you do either of those you slow down but your apparent wind doesn't really you know it goes it changes in a way that is confusing at least to me uh maybe I need no, 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 we, we have the same, the same, all the same issues. Mm. Okay, so I'm hoping that at some point uh, I can fix that. And here's how I'm going to fix it. So, so I started off with uh, with uh, the basic instruments and um, yeah, I got my fancy. There we go. So everything's on this box, right, which is this. So I get my fancy stuff from Garmin. I got my, my wind display and my depth sounder, and then it's got this... Um, it's got this the, the transducer, which this is an Airmar, another company that Garmin bought. Garmin just sucks up companies like a vacuum, right? Um, they bought uh, that Swedish company, uh, Nexus, right? And they didn't change this. So to connect a Nexus instrument into uh, an into K bus, you got you had this extra box in there. It's very annoying, but it converts the Nexus protocol into the I mean, two thousand protocol. Then I also have this kind of system on the side. I have one of the oldest, uh, like non-commercial AS transponders, West Marine AS-1000. They haven't sold the thing for like 15 years. My partner, who's a really good sailor uh, in San Francisco, bought the thing for you know offshore racing and it's still going. So I'm, I'm not gonna take it out anytime soon because it's still working. Um, so obviously that has a VHF connection and has its own GPS. Yes. Can you do me a favor and stop sharing your screen and start sharing it again? Because for some reason it froze, so no one can see your little button. Oh, no. <clears throat> you were moving fine on the camera, but for some reason the screen sharing was potatoed. <clears throat> All right, can you see it again? Yeah, it is visible. Okay. Um, so anyway, this thing now talks on Wi-Fi. That's where I do my Navionics. I'm going to keep that separate because it's one of those not broken to fix it. So, <laughs> so, so the stop. Just so physically, is each 
uh, black line with an arrow. Is that a yeah. that, those are wires? Yeah, those are little these little cables that go to each of your instruments, and and they all connect. What is the where's the pie? Where's a raspberry? Oh, that's coming, Vince. <laughs> He's um, got layers. I got layers. Yeah. Um, okay. Lila, you were right. I should have just done. Uh, so your AIS is hooked up to that old chart plotter. Thing. Yeah, well, that's actually just a tablet that you saw in the other oh, right. in the other uh, picture, and that just does Wi-Fi. Yeah. It, it's pretty cool. It does get AS targets, mm -hmm. and actually, I, yeah, you can't really see here, but um, for a target, it draws a line, which is like a vector representing its uh, its velocity and and um, you know direction, right? It's target you mean another ground, boat right? with AIS. Hmm? A target is another boat with AIS. Uh, yes, okay. with either a transceiver or a transponder. Right. No, it has to actually have a transponder to, right. to show mm -hmm. up. Um, but it's it's great because you if you see if it's nighttime and there's a cargo ship out there, it's drawing a line that represents a vector. So you kind of have a good idea if you're going to be um, hitting it, getting right or getting right <laughs> over. Yeah, more <laughs> hitting it, I'm with you. The longer the line, the faster they're going. It's like yeah, like watch or yeah, or marine traffic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I get this thing, and then when I got the instruments, Vince says, well, what are you going to do about mass you know, rotation compensation? At the time, I was like, well, I hadn't really thought about that. <laughs> I thought, well, I'll just eyeball it, right? Maybe put some lines on deck. <laughs> so uh, there's this guy, again, to go back to this open source thing, this guy named Randall, who actually bought Nige's uh, F32, I think, brought it out to Connecticut, built this thing, to do rotation compensation based on this Honeywell position sensor. So it's this little horseshoe and you put it next to your mast. And uh, you know, as your mast rotates, there's a little magnet that's on the mast and this thing detects it's analog. So it just sends you this voltage. And then I send it in, into this thing that's called an ESP32. And I'm gonna digress. Am I taking too much time? No, I mean, I'm, I'm learning. <laughs> so. It's so, not going to be as exciting for the second part. I'm just warning you there. <laughs> Enjoy the first part. <laughs> okay, so this little thing, the silver part, is called an ESP32. It's called a microcontroller, which means it's sort of a tiny little computer, also known as a system on a chip, because unlike this computer or this computer, everything you know that you need to do in this computer is actually in that little package there. <laughs> and it has Wi-Fi, it has Bluetooth. It's amazing. It slices, it dices. <laughs> um, the really cool thing about this is that it's about as powerful as the IBM ThinkPad laptop that I had in the mid-1990s. And this one cost about $4. If you buy them in bulk, you can get them for $0.35 cents a piece. So anything, I don't know if anybody here has like a smart thermostat or, or smart lights or anything in your house, all this automation stuff. It's what, when you hear Internet of Things, IoT, this is what they're talking about. They're talking about these, these little processors that are so cheap. There's a billion of these things out there in the world right now. They are in light bulbs. Are there on? Um, are they just one chip? Yeah, that's. It's called. Yeah, it's called. A, sometimes it's called a system on a chip or SOC because everything. Now this is a development board, so they they put like a USB interface to make it easy to program and stuff. But like everything is is right in there. It's got flash. It's got it's got RAM. Uh, this is the Wi-Fi antenna up here. <laughs> so so I. Uh, oh, it's also got these analog to digital. Uh, conversion a bunch of analog to digital conversion channels. So I take this uh, analog voltage from the rotation sensor. This thing converts it to digital. It then uses those libraries that I was talking about by this guy, Timo, the, fin the crazy Finnish guy who's still working on this stuff uh, tirelessly. He's like, he's a dynamo. Um, and they then take that information. Oh, they also take the, the original uh, wind information that's on the NMA 2000 bus. They correct it for rotation and then they spit it back out on the bus. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that doesn't work <laughs> because a Garmin instrument will sort of prefer to talk to this thing. And I've been discussing this with Garmin since August and we're still kind of narrowing in on, you sh I should be able to say, don't listen to that listen to that right there's a way in the interface that you can change that it just doesn't work and i suspect they're not going to change it for me can so you, can you separate the buses well that's a great who said that that's a great idea oh, it was both. um <laughs> so what we have now is i got in my little box on the boat i got 
two of these. Uh, now, this is okay. These things run at 50 milliamps when they're actually kind of computing, right? And for this stuff, they're doing nothing. They're just, they're almost literally sleeping. Computers sleep much of the time. These are sleeping most of the time. Uh, in fact, a lot of applications for this thing, they never they never plug it in. Like they have a little solar panel on a little battery and they just kind of last forever as long as there's any sun. Um, but of course I have 12 volts, so I have plenty of power. But when I'm looking at these things, I'm always thinking like in terms of like, okay, if I was going to do race with last year, someday I might. Um, we, you know, how much power do you need? And so I didn't actually have any of these instruments before. So I've actually done a lot of kind of power budgeting, right? But that's my frame of reference is not, I'm on a power boat, I'm gonna turn the motor on and just charge the batteries back up. My frame of reference is I have a single hundred watt solar panel. It's gonna be completely overcast and rainy for five days. <laughs> you know, how many amp hours do I need? And like, what can I run to kind of keep the boat going? Like what's the minimum? And of course, these instruments are actually optional, right? At some point you can shut all this stuff down and, and just use that, right? Or use paper charts. But that's kind of where I'm coming from in terms of like how much power, you know, I want the boat right, to be to be using. So this thing using 50 milliamps to do what it does is kind of insane. Anyway, so what I have right now is is this system where, yeah, the the um wind data comes into one, it talks to the other, so it corrects it, sends that to the other, and the other spits it out in the garment. Can't help but tell. listen, right? The garment doesn't know that this guy exists, so <laughs> it's a real hack. It's <laughs> hilarious. So, 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 can you just for the slower list? Can you trace each leg from the wind instrument? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, so this is at the top of the mast, right? Yep. So it's producing uh, data. It's not enemy in two thousand data. It's direction it's and Texas. speed. Yep. Wind direction, wind speed. Is that a wide connection down? It yeah. is, yeah. And we actually, somebody, I don't know if there's anybody from Bama on, but if there is, we, I was having this conversation about, about wireless. Mm -hmm. It's a whole different, interesting thing. So yeah, this is, I have a wire. I didn't have, in my old mask, the one that broke, I didn't have any wires. And it was great because it really does take maybe 10 or 20 pounds out of the mask. Now I have all the, I got the lights wiring. I used to have like a, a portable, like cigarette lighter, anchor light. Um, hey, I who's laughing? Out. That's perfectly accepting. That's what I got. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I had I didn't have a steaming light. I didn't have masthead nav lights. I didn't have a VHF antenna at the top at the masthead. I had a really good antenna from Fisheries that I put on a like a five foot carbon pole that I got from Nige actually, and and that worked perfectly fine. And in fact, when I was dismasted, we still had VHF, right? So, <laughs> uh, but now I got the new mast, got all these wires. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is a wire connection. Then this little guy translates the old Nexus stuff to NME A2000 and spits it out. So the, the thing at the top is generating 180, well, 183? No. No, it's actually, it's Nexus data. I thought about like interpreting that and uh -huh. I went down that path, Vince. It was not, it was not good. It was not a good place to be. Um, so no, this, this talks Nexus, it's a protocol called FDX. Okay, so it's a proprietary thing. This thing is sort of Garmin's interpretation of the old Nexus race software running on, like when you bought Nexus, you would spend like $30,000 and you would actually get literally a computer that would let you connect all these instruments in. And then at some point they said like, oh, we gotta deal with enemy 2000. So they put it, that interface on there. Garmin kind of shrank all that down. So this, this is another microcontroller. It's not an ESP32, yeah. it's an older one. So this reads this data in FDX protocol and then it changes it into NME and 2000 protocol. Okay. Spits it out on this bus. That guy. Uh, goes into this thing called this uh, Sailor Hat ESP32, which essentially is, is one of these, right? Yeah. It's a special one because it's it's got the interface. It runs in 12 volts and all this stuff. Um, that then takes in this variable voltage between zero and 12 volts from this sensor, depending on where it is, you know, on the mass. <clears throat> Uh, it, it converts that to a digital a number, yeah. essentially. Converts that number to degrees. Yeah. Corrects. This Did thing. you have to program the the hat thing? Yes. But again, this was that all came from this guy Randall, uh -huh. who did this great thing where he wrote all this software, and then he said, "Here you go. It's on this. There's a website called GitHub where you put oh, yeah. all of this open source software in. Like if you create something and you want other, you just want to share it." Um, and it's, you know, you think about like Microsoft, like 
They don't do that, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> oh, you're right. You're right. And and they own GitHub. Well, okay, but I'm thinking about things like uh, Word. Okay, so you're not going to get source code for Word or Windows 10. Oh, you're right. Word. No, you're right. That's a fair point. They do a lot of support for open source, but it's a real their own GitHub. Okay, but I mean, all right, you guys, computer geekos, you know, AWS, calm down. But, AWS owns, AWS owns free RTOS. So, yeah. Um, so, yes, they do. They have come around to that. You're still not going to get the source code for Windows 11. 25 years. Well, when they release the source code for Windows 11, then I'll be, I'll be sold on that. Yeah. But, okay, bad example. Um, most traditional software companies are not out there sort of releasing their code, but there's all these individuals and even small companies like... Um, What's the solar charge controller company? Uh, know, we all have? Victron. Reddish. Oh, oh. No, not Reddish. You know, uh, Victron. Uh, Victron. Yes, Victron, yeah. they're really. They have built interfaces into directly into Signal K. They're great. They've really embraced this, right? So anyway, um, I take this data. I I correct it. I send it to another ESP32 because the whole it's a whole sort of Garmin thing. Um, it sends it out on another, basically, to, so I have two of these on my boat, right? And they're not connected to each other, except for through that. What is the radio doing here for us? Well, that was, we were going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> because the radio uh, is a DSC VHF, and it, it has, so it has a GPS on it. And I thought, oh, it might be kind of handy to have the GPS info from there. And so that is now connected to this guy you, <laughs> with an NMEA 0183 connection, and then another thing that this guy does is he takes that data and he spits it out in the NMEA 2000 uh, uh, protocol. So, okay. so my Garmin now shows my latitude and longitude. So it's kind of a backup to this whole thing. Nice. If this whole thing breaks, I still know where I am because I have another GPS. You know, when you're sailing, you have like five GPSs on your boat, right? right? You, you might have an AIS. You probably have one in your radio and then you got like one in your phone and who knows what. Right? So that's just redundancy. <laughs> And then Vince, you asked, where's the Pi coming in? So that this guy is my Raspberry Pi, and he just sits on that network too and um and collects all this data because again, I was talking to Vince about this a while ago. Uh, I'm recording a lot of data, but what I really want is uh apparent wind speed, apparent wind angle, speed through the water, and you know, speed through the ground is kind of nice. But for them from those first three data points, the more of that I collect, I'm starting to develop polars for my boat, which my boat is kind of a custom one-off boat, right? Nobody's going to do polars. And also, if you look at a polar chart, it's like 5, 10, 15 knots, right? That's what it gives you. And then you're supposed to sort of extrapolate. Eventually, eventually, it's going to take a long time, I will have a complete set of polars for any wind direction or speed, which means at any time, my boat can tell me you're pinching or you're sailing too low you know, or you're just kind of being more. And as I said to Vince, <laughs> I'm going to do a very simple app for the phone. It's just going to be a big green arrow or big green dot. Oh, and if the green me. dot, right, turns into a yellow arrow, that means, oh, better sail that way a little bit. If it turns into a big red arrow, <laughs> hey, <laughs> I really have to sail, right? Because that's how it is, John. Aren't you going to need speed all the ground in order to get to a game? No, that's an excellent, there's a lot of, uh, I want to say debate, but a lot of discussion about this because speed over ground is almost irrelevant mm -hmm. for for uh, for um, VMG because if you're imagine if you're sailing upwind uh, and there's like a one knot current at ninety degrees, right? A current. So that is going to impact your sort of upwind vector, which means that when you're on the opposite tacks. Basically, it means if the is if you're sailing north and there's a uh, current setting west, then your port tack is going to be slower than your starboard tack, kind of no matter what you do, relative to the ground. So okay, when so that's course over the ground, right? Uh, yes, but your course over ground and your and your speed over ground are kind of they're they're kind of intertwined, right? You can't kind of separate. Okay. I mean, the bottom line is that oh, of if you Google this, you'll spend hours going down the, the same rat hole I did, and I encourage you to do that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but ultimately, you if you want to 
if you want to calculate VMG, which is really what we're after here, right? Like, am I going faster, going higher, or am I going, am I getting, am I going to get there faster, going a little bit higher, or am I going to get there faster, going a little bit lower, right? That's all we care about. That is only relative to uh, where you're, how you're going through the water in terms of maximizing your boat's the, speed through the water. The buoy that you're going through is on land. Too. Yes. It's attached to the ground. Right. And that's why. And the VMG is based on pseudo Ah, uh, yes. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you can, you, yes, you calculate your VMG to a mark based on your speed over ground, but that can be really confusing because there are always currents. Right. So if you want to sort of simplify it and say, like, all right, I'm in a race, I'm sailing up wind. It doesn't really matter right now where the mark is, right? Because I'm not that close to it. Then I need to maximize my VMG through the water until I get to like a ley line or something where I have to decide, okay, you know, which tack is more efficient than the other tack. It's I I I yeah. see, but I can you're see. always wanting to you know, no, I mean, yeah. to wanting that you no, do it off to one side. The current is away. Yeah, yeah. 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 the one yeah. The current influences that, but you want to know the, the VMG to the mark. Yeah. Right. But the you problem is that to maximize. It is, but if you yeah. are trying to sail based on VMG to the VMG to the mark over ground, then you're you're not looking at actually how fast your boat is going. What I want to do is figure out, okay, where do I have to point to get my boat to go faster, either upwind or downwind? For me, that's the first consideration. Once I've got the boat going as fast as I can make it go, then I might look at another display that says, hey, you're going fast, but you kind of need to be on the other tack, right? <laughs> that is valid, but for VMG upwind, purely upwind, you are you got to be looking at uh, speed through the water. Yeah, well, it's true because at some points in the back, you're, you're going closer or farther away from the yeah. mark. Yeah. Well, other than, going, of tacking, you know, other than yeah. going straight up to the mark, every time you go off to one side, your VMG to the mark is worse than, than on the other tack. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of... You know, you right, because it's right. yeah. complete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because the mark is never, if it was yeah. dead upwind, that'd be great. And so, and, so you, listen, you guys, you know you're gonna, I, I want to encourage us to, um, <laughs> to finish up, to Drop finish up, because now, this is great. Fred, this is great. You're awesome. But <laughs> Fred has got, you know, well, you got night. commitment. <laughs> you're going to the rest. This is amazing. Amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, have, I have one more slide, and then I'm going to. Bill, I have a question about that device, the horseshoe. Yeah, uh, yeah. can you just talk a little bit about physically how that's is that mounted in the mast, on the mast, on the deck? How does that work? Um, actually, great question because I have a picture of it. That... Okay, so this isn't mine. Okay, so that's the gadget, right? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What, what gadget? It's Which gadget? gadget? We'll get. We'll get back to that. This is actually Randall's. His setup is much cooler because he's got a black carbon fiber. I have a, I know I have a carbon fiber mask, but it's white. <laughs> and actually, mine it made more sense to mount it behind the mask. But, but yeah, it's mounted to the to the mask uh, base plate. And then he has this sort of like uh, metal rod going down. It just has a magnet, and so as as the mask rotates it. Now, of course, he had to add the correction. I had to subtract the correction. I, I figured that out eventually um, because <laughs> I'm behind the mask, right? But so on a on a uh, Corsair mask, there's a there's the mask base section, and it's got this sort of almost like a vein, but just a supporting piece of metal. So I just drilled a hole through that, attached um, the magnet to it, and you know I had to figure out the right radius so it moves in the same same arc but slightly smaller. So I have another question, which is so then the um, so the VNG system yeah. claims to be able to do this too. Yes. And I haven't worked out how to do it. But I'm well, wondering, is there a, an any Me neither to that. <laughs> me neither. And that's why is, I'm there an talking NBA's, about is yeah, good part. for mass correction. Like, is there a sig? Is there a PGM for, uh, for mass correction? No, no. And this seems like desperately be useful. Yeah. No. I mean. Uh, Fred could talk about like the way if you have VNG, then the way you want to do it is probably the way that they're doing it. That it's Fred's doing it on Mojo. Very um, expensive. Uh, <laughs> you have to no, buy that, that, not the way they're doing it actually. All right. Um, anyway, so this is the gadget. This is that all those little boxes on the screen. So there's this. This is the thing called the sailor hat. It's got a teeny little display. Um, and then there's this one of these things. Is the, is the pie in there too? Here. 
<laughs> no, no, because the pie does say, I'm not going to keep that on the boat all the time. Huh. Um, so, uh, and then this is actually what's connecting to the VHF. What are those dumbbells and wire nuts doing in there? I you know, wire nuts. I'm a little bit proud of it. I have a question about the magnet. Can you describe if you had to do anything to calibrate that? After yes. Is there a yeah. Um, what you had one time, you rotate the mast all the way in one direction and the other direction. This is in my code. So if you guys use what I, my code's on GitHub now too. Okay. I'll buy Microsoft. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you use if you use my code, you'll see. I even put comments in there. If you and in fact, it's you can't read this, but it says on the display the the maximum, minimum, and current values of that sensor so you just rotate it all the way this way you rotate it all the way that way if those numbers that show up here are different from what's in the code then you just change the ones because it forces it into a range based on that maximum and minimum number it's a linear exchange yeah okay yeah yeah it's very it's a good that's one of the nice things about the sensor um and with that <laughs> let's so this is how i do it um but you know we've oh and also there's oh, sorry that's uh, all right we're gonna get into <laughs> Um, if we have time, I want to I want to talk a little bit about about steering to wind and overboard protection, and then we're going to talk about Mojo. But but then I also want to talk about how celestial navigation. Uh, <laughs> it's how this is this is a magnetization sensor that's based on celestial navigation. But I want to do that if we don't if we have time because uh, because I've talked a lot. No, yeah, it was really cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> And by the way, Bill and I met on his boat at Shell Shoal, and I got to see the data center up close. <laughs> it is really cool. <laughs> um, the summary of that is don't take people working at AWS to work on the electronic of your boat. <laughs> no, because he made me do this. <laughs> Have you shared the uh, just share? Let's go, just go stop share. Well, it's, 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 it's all going on like this. Like, oh, I will never, ever, ever do that. <laughs> yeah, it's I'm fascinated. It is fascinating. I'm, not, uh, I'm like Bill. Bill's previous setup is me. Uh, um, but we just sit there and argue about the tension of foot. There it is. You know, we never. <laughs> I think about it myself. It's like, what the hell? I'm not racing. But you guys are racing. So that's a cool. All right. That was easy. Oh, dear. <laughs> that looks scary. All right. So this is Mojo. This is an F25C, which uh, Gina, Arthur, and I acquired back in September from a, a team that uh, did the race to Alaska last year. Uh, they had to stop pretty quickly. They hit a couple of logs at night and they tore off the rudder. Mm -hmm. So I think they stopped in Campbell River. In fact, when we acquired the boat, turned down the electronics for the first time, the BNG was still in Kimber Campbell River. <laughs> so they really turned it off and was like, we're going home. And then they they kind of they kind of gave up. Now we have the same problem as Bill when it comes to mass rotation. And I did a little bit of research. I actually started with the Raspberry Pi as well. So I did the whole Signal K Raspberry Pi. I have e-ink screens as well. So I started putting, putting that on there. But I was concerned about power consumption. I mean, you're running Linux on a computer for the sake of having a web server. A web server also consumes quite a bit of power. And I was concerned about, hey, is it going to reboot? Is it going to stop? It's also broadcasting the Wi-Fi signal. And when testing it, I just wasn't super happy with the results. Mm -hmm. So I kind of set it aside and I started researching a better computer for the boat. So I'm going to tell you then about what I did. But before I do that, I just want to have a little disclaimer. This is the current state of Mojo. So these are the electronics, <laughs> right? Is that a, a lot of cardboard? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little cardboard. So we're just increasing the size of the panel. And then Mojo right now uh, is sitting on four stands, courtesy of the uh, Northwest Multi Hall Association. <laughs> there's no mass, there's nothing. We tore off everything and it's entirely sanded. And this is Gillen's house. So the, the boat's in Bellevue right now. So everything I'm going to tell you about works on paper, works in my basement where I currently have all the electronics but we haven't tested it in real life. And we're gonna start doing that in April. So take everything with a pinch of salt. Uh, so Mojo, if you don't know, Fari F25C from 96, 27 foot long. 
Uh, it's very light boat, 1,800 pounds, and it's hull number six. So it was uh, manufactured by a professional because before it became a kit after, I think, hull number 10 to 12. Mm. All right, back in the room, you have Gina and Arthur there. <laughs> and uh, we're doing Race to Alaska. And so those three pictures are on our website for Race to Alaska and we're in our uh, the file, our application file. What's my inspiration for the setup? As I told you, I started on my own thinking, okay, I'm going to do Raspberry Pi, Signal K is great. Uh, and then you can overlay the charts. But then I found uh, this post, um, I can't remember the forum, it's uh, one of the Google forums uh, by Don Vinci, who explains his current setup. And what I like about the post is that one, he said it, it works. <laughs> Second, it's cheap. And the entire setup, I mean, there's a Garmin 3 axis, I think it's 150 bucks, plus there's a ship module, which is $400. So we're talking $550 tops uh, to have mass rotation adjustments. And very easy to set up. The setup is really three components. I'll show you the diagram in a minute. But what was appealing to me is that it uses the BNG, um, the Zegin 100 compass. It's a compass. Uh, it's a GPS that has compass, and it has roll and pitch as well. So it's also a three axis. Uh, yeah. Sends that to the N2K bus, uh, and is really good quality. What's an N2K bus as opposed yeah. to this other stuff? No, so this is that's the this is the N2K okay. bus. Okay. Yeah, so. <laughs> Everything either works off uh, NME A0183 or the uh, NME 2000, so the N2K bus. So this is our current setup on Mojo, and the the parts I've highlighted are the one I'm going to be the ones I'm going to be talking about. Here you have the NME A2000 backbone, where you know we're connecting the wind pack, we're connecting this Miniplex, the computer I'll be telling you about. I should have highlighted it. Uh, we have the Garmin 3-axis compass, which I've added to our setup. The original BNG ZG100, which is used by our MFD here, the Vulcan. And then the VHF is also connected. The AIS is also connected to that bus. So pretty much everything is on the MA, NMEH 2000 bus. There is one additional connection here from the AIS into the Miniplex, into the Miniplex which is the uh, 01A3 connection. So... It is redundancy, uh, and if the NME bus uh, doesn't work, I still have my IS. Um, I could connect it straight to the VHF, and I still have the Miniplex. Um, of course, the trans transducer is also connected to the backbone. Now, there's a little part here that I want to talk about. We've been talking about apps, and I've been writing code, which is on GitHub, but not publicly accessible, um, <laughs> yeah. because with the Miniplex, I'm able to very quickly write an app to have all my instruments data. And Bill was talking about one metric I love is uh, speed over ground versus boat speed and whether the current is in favor or unfavorable. What I find amazing in all the races I've been in is people are like, okay, what's our speed over ground? What's our boat speed? And people do this calculus kind of mentally each time. I just want one line that says, you know, if it's green plus 1.2, that's 1.2 knots of currents in my favor. If it's red, that's 1.2 knots against me. And it's just as simple as that. And I want to be able to navigate to that. And I want to be able to navigate to my uh, apparent wind angle and my, my apparent wind speed. So it's a very simple setup. Uh, I try to simplify it as much as possible and, and remove all sorts of things from when we bought the boat because I want it to be reliable. The one thing I've been doing in the past three weeks is actually rewire everything. Uh, so I've checked all the wires, I've read on all the uh, all the connection with heat shrinks, um, and now I find it to be a very very reliable, very robust system. And you'll okay. be mounted in the boat. <laughs> uh, be, 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 be and I'm just water. going to bring it and I'm going to stick it in the boat. The only thing that's going to change is the wiring will will glue maybe to to the walls, but that's it. Nothing else changes from how it looks in my basement. So here's the ship module. Here is this little revolutionary computer. What I love about it versus a Raspberry Pi is that it starts in under 10 seconds. Within 10 seconds, this thing will broadcast, well, one, convert your enemy at 2000 that it gets from here. Um, it will convert it to 0183 because it's, it's a standard that is easily readable, uh, readable for any instrument or any app. And it will broadcast it 
uh, back on either NMEA here or in the NMEA 2000 or on the Wi-Fi, there's a little antenna here. So super fast, super robust, very simple to set up. Um, and then it, you know, it's connected to the 12 volt. I mean, it, it is really simple to do. And he does multiplexing, which- Maybe one thing to, uh, to yeah. specify is NMEA 0183 is the old protocol mm -hmm. and that has been superseded by NMEA 2000. And right. a lot of uh, both owners like us have older instruments that they lost and that works. So you don't want to, you know, uh, spend the money to you for a new one. Are still using that old protocol. And that thing is actually speaking the both languages. Protocol is nothing else than a language. So it speaks both and basically allow the interconnection. Go on. That's right. No, that's exactly right. And so if I go back here, the wind pack. Right now connected to the NMA 2000, but really there is a little box in between, a little bit like your Nexus, which converts NMEA 0183 into NMEA 2000. So when I talk about simplification, one thing I'd love to do is connect it directly to the to the Miniplex. Um, so it is a multiplexer. What does that mean? It means you can take any of the inputs and then send it to any of the outputs. <laughs> And what you can do in the process is do conversions and calculations. And this is where the mass rotation thing comes into play. This is when you, when you connect to the ship module, you'll have the input signals and you'll be able to say, hey, I'm seeing in this input, this signal. So say the, the first compass, the one that's affixed to the boat. Oh, I'm seeing the compass, you know, giving me a heading of say zero, zero degrees, right? Straight north. And then you can have the second, the steady cast affixed to the mast, which will say, hey, I'm seeing currently uh, five degrees, right? Which means it's tilted. So you've got the boat and you've got the mast tilted five degrees. So your apparent wind angle needs to be corrected by those five degrees. And that is all it does. And the beauty of the multiplexer is that it can either override the signals that your MFD, that your BNG gets, or it can send it as a new, uh, as a new stream. So if in your BNG, you can say the parent wind angle comes from that instrument and you can select. The ship module actually creates a virtual instrument, a virtual input, which you can name whatever you like, and it will get it from there. So when it comes to a parent wind angle, I'm just going to say to my BNG, capture my virtual wind vane. And that's going to be the result of this operation, the difference between uh, main heading, mass heading, and uh, the measure from the top of the mast in apparent wind angle. So it is really that simple. So are you just attaching the the um, compass to a mast? Correct. So weird, and just letting it rotate with the mast. The BNG is in the boat, and so it does. You know, it's the compass, GPS, and rolling pitch. And the steady cast is just we're going to strap it to the mast. Mm -hmm. See a yeah. reason to actually, you know, keep it fixed there. I think we'll we'll get it out when we need it. We'll see how, how we do that. You can just Velcro it to the mass, and that's all you need, as long as it was not. What about the uh, late, latency? Does it, does it respond quickly enough? So it is amazing. So we, we talked about the speed of the bus, and you know I have several updates per second on the messages. So it's really not an issue. So the instrument itself is very quick to respond. Yeah, in fact, so the two compasses tend to send their messages exactly at the same time on the bus. And I see two lines. I have a screenshot of that, um, which I'll show you in a second. But a uh, sort of irony is actually the mass rotation doesn't change rapidly, does it? I mean, you, the mass is rotated. It kind of stays there. It may twist a little bit. When you're in the tack, it's, yeah, it's probably true. There's a little yeah. wind that might move constantly. Yeah. And that's where you really need to know your apparent wind angle. Yeah. Because yeah. that's where you no, have to search it from a Does it compensate for heel? Small. Does it, sorry? Compensate if you're heat, what you're healing. Um, no, it doesn't compensate when I'm healing, although I do have those measures. And so I could add that. You know what, though? That the, the, the compasses are. Yeah. That's one of the things I discovered when I was trying to put one on the top and one on both the Both BNG and the are, 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 they are there. So, okay. Well, that, I'll be able to test for that. That's well, that's, yeah. 
I'd argue you don't need to compensate because all of your compasses yeah, are moving with the boat. So they're well, all but, wrong by the yeah, same amount. Yeah, but you still want the BNG yeah, to be the mass one of them to be accurate. <laughs> right. So well, mass isn't. So it, you know, say say you have a roll of say five degrees or yeah. Your mass, depending on the tension of your shroud, may not exactly follow that angle. Oh. So okay. what about uh, going up and down waves, uh, waves of different heights and different lengths? Um, it, it does. It's a. It says three axes. So yeah, yeah it does. Both of them have that pitch and yaw. Okay. Well, wow. so you know, it, it's a simple setup. Again, right now it's in my basement. It works. I have the two measures. They compensate, and I'm hopeful that when I get it on the boat, you know, I get the right the right data. Now, so do you have a, some kind of a mule that moves around? I mean, do you have like a table that's yeah, kind of. Kids. I uh, yeah. <laughs> so I just I just fold them and I you know I, I, I move them both and I look at the data and I look at the compensation. Now what I've been able to do thanks to the ship module is actually write a little app which captures the signal sent by the ship module. So the ship module will broadcast data saying here's all the data that is streaming currently on the bus. It does it in the MA, NMEA0183 protocol, so it's it's really strings of text and it's really easy to parse. And it does it over the UDP protocol, which means you don't need a one-for-one -one connection. The, the chip module computer will just broadcast it out in the air. It doesn't care whether it's received or not. It just broadcasts all that data. The benefit of that is that it's like a VHF, right? When you're pressing the button, everybody can hear. Here it's the same. You could have 100, 200 users listening to that data and seeing those instruments. So my goal is for all of us on the boat to either have you know, an iPhone strapped to their forearm or an Apple Watch that will have all this data. So you can see I've created a little app here. And you know it's got, right now, speed over ground, speed over water, apparent wind angle. That's the corrected one true wind speed and depth. And then for now, I'm just watching the measures from the different compasses. Uh, by the way, the AIS yeah, also has its own metrics. It's got two GPSs. Um, so I can use that as, as redundancy, but it's really gonna be, the, the apparent wind angle is gonna be corrected for the difference between those two instruments. And so it's it took me, I don't know, not, not a lot of hours to put that together, maybe four. Uh, and it, it works really well and it uses your phone. And so if you lose your MFD, if you lose everything, you still have on your phone, you have the Navionics and you can still race because you have all the performance metrics as well. Can you go back to the the compass that is attached to the mast? Yeah. You lost track of that. Cast. The steady. Can you tell me about that again? So the steady cast is a three axis compass. So it it's it's a little block like like this. I could have I could have yeah. brought it. It's a, a square, square box. You attach it to the mast. It's got an arrow on it, uh -huh. which uh, basically says, you know, point in a direction forward. And it will give us it will give us a compass measurement. It, it's three axis, so it's, yeah, yeah. it also has the pitch and roll. Uh, and it will, it will give us its angle. And so what matters is the angle that this compass sees relative to the, the angle that the, the boat compass sees. Right. And the difference is what is, makes is the, the thing. Angle so adjustment. compared to Bill's setup, do you guys have a sense of, you know, how accurate these different? Yeah, that's a good question. From from forums, uh, what I've read is my setup has an error margin of two to three degrees, whereas Bill's setup is more accurate. But Bill's setups are, are also more expensive, I believe, right? The sensor is, yeah. Yeah, the set, it's 400, the sensor itself? What is it? Well, yeah, four or five hundred dollars just for that center. Just the, for the whole the computer that I'm using was forty dollars. The the ESP thirty two. When you say that the sensor that remind me well, that little horse horse shield. Shield. Oh, the horse shell deal. Because yeah. so that's for rugs as much as the uh, as the uh, Garmin. I got it. So, so which is the more sort of robust? I mean, I, I would worry about the horseshoe that you get a line caught in there, or there's some. Yeah, I thought about that a lot. Like where it's where I put yeah. it. And and the relationship, I mean, it's really directly underneath the back of the mast. And so I'm really not concerned about it getting. And it's also a really sturdy little thing. I think the steady cast is probably just as sturdy. And, you know, after we we were talking about this on my boat, and I, I actually went down this path of trying to build this, build that on my own. But um, <laughs> it's, it's hard to think. 
And so I think there's a Garmin, this, the, first of all, the B and G compass is super accurate. It's worth whatever thousands of dollars somebody pays for it. The Garmin is only 150 or 200 dollars. It's right. actually really it. It's one of the only Garmin things that seems like it's a really good value. <laughs> and I compare it against the the B and G one, and and they're pretty pretty much the same. I mean, again, in my basement, but they they're spitting out the same values, given the same angle, and they're reacting at the same so, same, so same pace. Back to kind of an earlier point, you're interested in the difference. Correct. Does a pitch and roll matter at all? I mean, you're only looking for the difference. So if you ignore those other aspects, which seems with the intermediate, assuming everything's aspects. vertical, that's true. Uh, again, the the mast itself will not only pivot like this horizontally, but depending on trout tension, it will pivot like this. Mm -hmm. So by, by enough degrees to make that. I mean, like you talked about two or three yeah. degrees error. Do you have two or three degrees? Much? I'm not. I'm not worried about that for now. I'm just. Yeah. I'm just. Yeah, I'm guess. just thinking of correcting for the horizontal. Yeah. And but, see, see what if we can. If I can interrupt, I started making a, a digital compass out of this. This is a three-axis magnetometer, and it is striking how if it's sitting on your desk like this, it gives you one reading for which which way is north. If you do that, it's a totally different read. The the Z axis axis has a big impact on what this thing reports. Huh. So you're right. If you're just looking at the, the difference between the two and they're kind of in the same X, Y, and Z plane, right? But but they're not, right? If one's in the back of the boat and one's at the mast, then they're, huh. they're not in the same place on the wave, right? And so I was shocked at how much of a difference that made. I can Plus, record that data anyway. So we'll we'll record that data and see if it matters. Yeah, yeah, no, very interesting. We'll do this again in a year. <laughs> <laughs> If it's a metal mast, does that and you're having to put it right next to a metal mast? Yeah, so it does say on the manual of Steadicast, you know, do calibrate accounting for your environment. So put it on the mast and then calibrate against either another compass or you know what you have on the chart to adjust for for potential issues. And I can do that very easily in the ship module. I can enter adjustments. Um, so yeah, it it works on paper. Uh, it seems robust. It doesn't consume too much power. It's the ship module is designed for marine electronics as opposed to the Raspberry Pi. Starts really quickly, reboots really quickly. We'll have to see how long it lasts and uh, how good the results are. But um, you know, very hopeful that for you know five hundred and fifty bucks, we we get ourselves a good setup. Fantastic. Very cool. Wow. Cool. This do either of you have any experience fiction. with uh tactic wireless instruments? I had a wireless instrument that wasn't a tactic, it was uh like a kind of a Kickstarter company in Nova Scotia that did this um uh, wireless wind, you know, wind sensor, solar right. powered, and and it never it didn't really work for me, mo mainly because it wasn't really waterproof. Um, and with with wireless instruments, I think the problem is that you, um, first of all, anything wireless consumes a lot more power. And um, because of that, they tend to restrict the range. So like for the Garmin G-Wind wireless, in fact, one of the guys at, at Bama who I was talking to, uh, it has a limit of 50 feet and his mass is 50, more than 50, a little more than 50 feet, right? So we just can't use the wireless. And so, and that was my experience too. Like you get the, um, you know, this this was connected to my phone. It was an app on the phone. You get it just a few more feet away, and it just it doesn't. It's not getting any data. They also have the problem of latency because, like, the time it takes for the data to travel like, is way higher than through the wire for most of the protocol. So you yes. also enter timing issues because the data that you get is data from the past. But it's traveling at the speed of light. No. What's <laughs> <laughs> the decision of what it It's turning on the light and take it and respond to it. That's what it's doing. Any so, more questions? Hey, hey this is uh, Trolls uh, McCombus from Bama. Um, I used uh, tactic instruments on my F27 for, for many years, and it works, works pretty well, but it's not foolproof. Um, that uh, solar wind sensor at the top of the mast uh, was fine in terms of range for the F27. Um, but there were definitely cases where the, it, it just wouldn't find it on the, on the wireless sometimes. 
Um, so you couldn't sort of 100% count that it would always be there. Because it didn't have enough battery and it needed to recharge? Was that... Yeah, I mean, it was sitting in the sun. It was sitting with the mast up, so that wasn't really an issue. But it's like when you power it up, it goes through a little discovery process to find the, you know, the various instruments. And I had a little, you know, wireless network uh, with other tactic um, instruments on there, the race compass, that kind of stuff. I really like the race compass, by the way. But um, um, but the but the wind sensor, there would definitely be times when it would just it just wouldn't come up when I powered up the system or you know, I might be out in a race and then suddenly there was no wind signal. Um, so it's, it's not 100%. Oh, I've, I've had the, uh, the tactic system on our boat, uh, F-31, and uh, with the wireless wind sensor at the top of the mast and the, the rotation sensor at the bottom of the mast. Um, and the only time that we've had issues with our wind sensor is when water got into it. And then you got corrosion, and then the whole thing just went to, went to crap. So they had to, had to replace the the innards on that once. But um, uh, the seal was bad from a manufacturer, so I got a new seal anyways. Fix that problem. Um, but the other issue that I've had at that system is that the the rotation sensor, which is essentially just another compass. I don't think it's anywhere near as accurate as the uh, the newer versions uh, that the Garmin's put out um, does, I don't know, they don't give a whole lot of details on it. It's just, they sell it as a rotation sensor. You stick it on the mast and you calibrate your, your main ship compass, you know, the, the electronic compass that is in the tactic system as well. And it cal calibrates the, uh, the rotation as, uh, at the same time. Um, it's accuracy level seems, you know, as good as, I don't know, maybe two, two degrees. But, you know, you got, and, and the same thing with the, the ship module set up where you're comparing compasses. You've got one compass that's good to three degrees and you got another compass that's good to three degrees. That's a total of six degrees yeah. off, potentially. Yeah. And you start doing trig on that number and those numbers can get, you know, pretty far off pretty quick. But um, I think the 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 rotation piece that, uh, that sensor that Bill is using, that thing's, it's it's designed for robotics um, in in industrial settings, and it probably has I don't know it, it. I'm imagining it's I've seen it somewhere. I think its accuracy is is less than a tenth of a degree. Yeah, that's great. So it's pretty it's pretty tight. Um, so that's pretty cool. I, I think I think and it, it's it's built pretty tough that as long as you got a good spot to get that magnet close and and whatnot i think that's that's a good way to go however how accurate can you sail like can you hold it can you hold a one degree course <laughs> um you got to be pretty close to do that so you know you, you're only as accurate as you can steer really but uh i haven't had the issues with the tactic um other than making sure everything's calibrated so once it's calibrated it works pretty good so at least from my experience i have a uh, i have a comment uh it's rick walton smith from uh, bama in the bay area and uh, i have a, a direct mechanical mass rotation sensor which is essentially the same as a rudder indicator hockey puck and you know it once i get it dialed in it really is accurate it's probably three degrees off one side two degrees off the other However, I don't raise and lower my mast, you know, so one of the things with the, with the smaller boats that go on trailers is this electronic interface is much more flexible. When I have to take my mast down, uh, I have to uh, essentially recalibrate my hockey puck uh, because of the mechanical lever there, plus the mechanical lever, I built a little box around it so we don't step on it when we're near the mast. But once it's uh, dialed in, it's uh, it's very good. And I rotate my mast, uh, you know, thirty degrees in each direction. So it's a it's a full uh, rotating mast with a with a uh, wing shape. But that's a my mechanical alternative. It's not as desirable if you're going to trailer your boat and raise your mast up and down. Yeah, for the Honeywell sensor, the the um horseshoe the sensor stays on it's mounted on the mass base 
And the other part is just a magnet that stays on the mast. So that would actually be really good for trailering. The, um, the, the co dual compass system, you'd have to unplug it, but you'd, so you'd want like a quick, take the quick connect or off. something. Yeah. You know. yeah. And, yeah. So Bill, how, how does your system, I mean, do you have the same worry that uh, was being talked about of, of, of the change in mast angle, mask rake or mask cant? No, because- um, uh, would throw the, out your, your magnet kind of interface. Yeah, it? my mast doesn't, doesn't move around. I mean, the, the amount that the mast kind of moves around is, is way less than I'll ever, it's, I'm not yeah. that good a sailor. <laughs> well, but it, right? So that, my like, margin of error is way bigger yeah. than, than that margin of error. You don't cant your mask, do you? you? You're just talking about some prop. No, exactly, yeah. exactly. I'm just talking about the shroud, so. so, it's but, so with the, but with any system, the or with the magnetic system, it's, it's so for the, the Honeywell sensor, it doesn't matter which, where your boat is pointed, right? Because it's not detecting the magnetic field. And this is something that, so I tried to do, so I, after we had this conversation, I thought, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna build that. So this is a, a, a magnetometer. And so I actually built a, a digital compass. And, and that's when I realized how good a deal the Garmin is because it's actually really hard to get it right. In fact, this thing sitting on my desk will give these varying readings. And then the minute you, you tilt it, you know, it's you, because I wasn't compensating for the, the Z axis, right? So. Um, and then it also, you, you have to, every time you move it anywhere, you have to recalibrate it. And so once they've got this thing on the boat, they're, they're fine. Right. So, so Garmin and B&G and, and, you know, uh, Nexus, whoever, they've put a lot of work into making those things as accurate as they can. Whereas with the Honeywell sensor, well, it's just a, it's just this analog device, right? It's, it's pretty foolproof. Let's talk about the BNG. There was a question earlier about, oh, can you account for mass rotation in the BNG? We have a Vulcan V9. The advertising says it accounts for mass rotation. <laughs> the installation manual says it accounts for mass rotation. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. And I wrote to BNG and they just wouldn't respond. Yeah. They, yeah, probably know, they probably know about it. Yeah. There is not <laughs> one setting in this instrument that it has for that. But it can't, unless you I wouldn't, you did. They, like, that's I right. But they said, they, they, they claimed that they claimed yeah, that they I, were able to have to pose that logic of if there are different uh, meetings. Use S. Sort of use S at the end of last year with the same kind of expectation. <laughs> I saw this claim. And it's you know, crickets. And you spent a lot more money. Yeah. What's super interesting about the ship module, the service is great, ships really fast, it's cheap. Uh, the support's amazing, they respond instantly. Well, well, so what I have worked out is that the Garmin, sorry, uh, the BNG digital radar has got the sensor in it. That's what I believe is happening. Because if you look at what they say about how the system works for catamarans, large catamarans with rotating mass, it all assumes you've got their radar system. Uh, so I think inside the radar, <laughs> so I asked if you could real quick. Um, I've got a, a BNG Zeus three, and uh, it has one setting in its menu somewhere, or it says can correct for mass rotation. And I, as far as I can tell, it. it on the system I have, it doesn't know how to do that. However, what I did get from um, B and G at one point when I asked about it was that if you have the H five thousand CPU yeah. on board, it puts out the information that the Vulcan and the Zeus need to compensate for mass rotation. But the H five thousand is doing the actual computation for it. Yeah, what that's exactly correct. Um, so this trolls from Bama again. Uh, the H5000 has an analog input, so you can connect uh, the the sensor directly to the H5000 unit, and then it will put out the corrected um, angle. How, however, um, even with the H5000, it, the way they've set up the menus in the uh, in the configuration interfaces, like the web server on the H5000, it's kind of confusing. And there's two different places where they talk about mass correction and one of them works and one doesn't work. So it, it but, but the functionality is there. <laughs> you, you just got to dig for it. Uh, the other thing I was looking, I want to say real quick is um, you said you were going to Velcro your compass to the mast. Um, I've tried that. The, uh, the, the Ray Marine piece had a, a way to Velcro it to the mast, mount it, screw it in, find a way to, I, I, it, I, 
found a way to put it in my, the, the sailed groove on the back of the mast, and that works perfect. The Velcro, it moves just enough. It's it, it's not, don't do it. <laughs> it's not accurate. You lose all your accuracy with that. You got it. Okay. Give feedback. Maybe we'll screw it in. We'll ask you not to uh, build a little bracket for it. <laughs> hey, um, Eric Steinberg here. Um, I'm a interloper invited invited in to listen about mass rotation. Um, and uh, just uh, weigh in on a couple of things. So the uh, mass rotation uh, for B and G on the Zeus and the Vulcan, uh, you would have to have their rudder indicator, which would be then designated as a mass rotation sensor. And then you would get mass rotation without having to have the H5000. Or with H5000, you can bring in an analog input as was, as was being discussed. Um, the Honeywell sensor is uh, off the hook good. We've used it for many years, mostly on uh, uh, measuring rudder angle, um, TP52s and uh, other Grand Prix boats. Uh, it is a really good proven sensor. Um, so I recommend that. Um, there are a lot of vagaries with mounting compasses to mast when, um, I think it was 2007 America's Cup, they, they used uh, a uh, ring laser gyro at the top of the rig. Uh, and so they were trying to measure um, mass twist, um, $80,000 part, uh, two of them, one at the one at deck level and one on the rig. Um, and that was successful because it was a highly accurate uh, uh, device. But the, I, I think you'll find that there is enough vagary between uh, between two compasses, especially as you're in a dynamic situation with heel, uh, because flux gate sensors are um, they're just prone to to uh, errors with heel. And they, you know, the manufacturers do a really good job of trying to correct for that. Um, but I think that, you know, if you have a delta of, of one or two degrees, um, and that relates to your wind calculation, that uh, inaccuracy start, inaccuracies start to flow, start to multiply downhill. Um, so anyhow, I, I, I think there's, you know, the, the, the mechanics of it will uh, partially dictate uh, what the best solution is for each installation. But uh, there's some, there's two cents for you. My takeaway is, yeah, we'll, we'll find some way of having a fixed bracket so that we always install the part and the compass in the same position. The I'm sorry, guys, can I, can I interject? Um, and the question to Eric, I guess. So my understanding here is I'm, I'm I'm in Panama on the 46 foot trimaran. Um, yeah, so uh, my understanding is that the question earlier about the BNG uh, the sentences, PNG sentences, um, it, it kind of it looks like if only you knew what the right sentences, you can send the uh, the information to the Vulcan or the Zeus. But uh, what Eric said is that if you have their uh, rudder rotation sensor, like a three hundred dollars sensor, then that's enough. I mean, did I understand this correct? Because I mean, my understanding was that the the problem with the Honeywell unit was that you need you need to be pretty good and um, you know in programming Raspberry Pi to send um, you know you know basically to to hack the problem, whereas um, the the the, the current kind of solution with the two compasses is good because the mini plexer takes the uh, apparent wind angle by uh, combining the uh, you know the, the the wind sensor and the and the mass rotation compass difference and sending it as if it's the kind of the the apparent wind angle. But it sounds what Eric said is that uh, you, you can go you can go straight to Vulcan. With the uh, uh, if you have the BNG brand uh, rudder rotation unit, is that, is that right? It, it sounds like a three hundred dollars solution uh, to this problem. Yeah, probably the but it's 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 mecha but mechanically it's not it's it's not as clean as what the the two solutions that 
were presented tonight. The Honeywell sensor is is just you know awesomely simple once it's mounted and uh, it's it's repeatable um, and is super accurate. I, I think the the prospect of having a, a microcontroller that listens to the Honeywell and then outputs a N2K uh, PGN um, is I, I think that's that's beautiful. I, I, I would I would love to have that. Um, no, no but that I, BNG doesn't tell you what that PGN code is, right? I that's mean, right. I that's right. And that's the that's the the yeah. There's the secret sauce there, and and it's an ongoing problem. Um, so, enemy A two thousand is is published and costs ten thousand dollars to get a, a window into, and then uh, the standard also allows for proprietary sentences. Um, so you know we do, we just don't stand much of a chance with that. Me, the hardware guy, doesn't stand a chance. You, the software guys, might have a much better chance. Good. Well, thank you very much. It was very helpful feedback. We'll come back to this forum to uh, let you know how we're doing with our measurements, and then we'll compare and contrast and maybe do some upgrades along the way. Oh, just one last point on the remark being made there about the BNG rudder sensor. Would, would it be possible to listen to it? I mean, like you had one of those just monitor what it's sending back and work out what the... So that's what these guys who, like Timo, uh, yeah. uh, there's a guy who interpreted uh, Nexus FDX. That's... So I'm not a programmer, really, and I was able to take somebody else's code and then modify a little bit and come up with this thing that, that works somehow by some miracle. You, to watch bytes moving across the wire and then figure out what, what they're saying... <laughs> That's just like, uh, that's way out of my <laughs> league. And that's what you have to do is you, because these are, I, I started down the path of trying to figure out the Nexus FDX protocol and somebody else had actually already done most of the work. And it's like, you're literally watching these hex numbers and you're trying to figure out like, well, wait, I saw that before. Well, how many bytes did I would go, you know, did I see but it? Not to dispute that, but you can do it in a controlled environment you know, you've got these, oh, nothing else yeah, changes. Yeah, yeah. You right. see what well, you get. Yeah. If so I the, move the rudder, the sensor, what does it do? Yes. Yeah. And yeah. the guy, the guy who interpreted FTX said he, yeah. he did it by um, motoring slowly in circles for hours. You can do it in your face with your fingers. So I, so yeah. in my, I, I work for Amazon and one of my previous roles, I worked on the car telematics and onboard diagnostics. So the, the car canvas. And uh, I did have an application to reverse engineer a lot of the, the brand's uh, <laughs> messages, uh, the pits. You probably shouldn't mention that. But, you know. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually, it's on GitHub. <laughs> uh, it's okay. It's private. Yeah. And uh, no, no, I mean, because we we're, were trying to figure out whether um, that we could capture some useful signals for preventive maintenance and whether we had an opportunity. Uh, I could probably run this against yeah. uh, the NTK. I'll probably give it a go. With that, thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you.